if you are the designer or if you are the owner, when you get a PNID like this, um, that just means that you need to, if you were to do any maintenance or even need to do from a very basic, uh, let's just start with the design. So if you're starting with a design, a blank sheet of paper, what you got to do is that when you draw it out, and then what you need to do is that you need to start to calculate all the different parts that you will need, the bill of materials, we call it, right? So if you just talk about just the components alone, you would have isolation, you have switching valves, uh, you get check, check valves, relief valves, you know, you're not even considering the fact that, for example, a check valve may have three different part numbers in the system. But if you were to generalize it, typically in this particular example, you would have something like this. And how, when you build a system like this, um, you would take account, you know, if uh, a contractor or any, anyone who actually gives you uh, this system, they will need to uh, charge you um, basically man hours to put them together. And this is how we actually quantify the value of a sample system like this. So you have 135 part numbers and 54 hours of assembly. Uh, what, this, what this means for, the, for, for you is that uh, as any user, uh, you may not worry too much about the assembly hours, but then you've got to worry about the parts that you've got to keep to maintain the system. So you have 135 different total part numbers that you need to put in your, uh, you know, you could say maintenance uh, items that you will need to uh, figure out later on. But this is a little bit of a headache here for you. Now, um, if you actually break them down to its uh, functional uh, portions of the sample system, you would see that in green here, you do have your sample extraction followed by a fast loop over here, and the ones in red you can see are just basically a switching. And the, the pink ones are basically a grab sample over here. And the return here has a return header. Now, switch lock will just show you that for here, we do have uh, a sample probe, which is just one part number. And this entire fast loop over here can be configured with just a single part number here like this. And the switching unit here, it's just uh, something that we can uh, provide and the grab sample as well as what we call a fluid distribution header, or basically it's just a header where you return it back to the process or maybe to the flare. So once uh, you see that we have actually what we produced are uh, all these individual subsystems, you could actually reduce all this down to just differently four part numbers. Of course, there will be some uh, hours you need to perform this assembly, but uh, you, know, you reduce all these part numbers down to just four. Switch log actually has something what we call the pre-engineered subsystems. Uh, in this page, you would see all of them, um, starting from the sample probe module, where you could have a probe that sticks into your process, either it would be a retractable type, uh, shown here, or you could have a fixed probe, uh, double block and bleed valves. Um, you also have what we see here as a fuel station where we drop down the pressure, and a fast loop over here as well as the calibration switching module here, where you actually have multiple streams to a single analyzer. And you can see over in this particular example, there are some valves, there's some uh, pressure gauges, and there's some, uh, I believe, some filters as well. Uh, and you could you could actually modularize this entire, uh, uh, you could say, subsystem. You have a fluid distribution header, and you have a grab sample modules over here. Uh, as you can see in this example, uh, the one on the left here, over here is a cylinder type uh, grab sample and he, over here is a container style grab sample. So this serves for both gas and liquid. Now today we'll be talking a little bit about fast loop modules uh, that Switchlot offers. Uh, Switchlot offers actually four different configurations of bypass uh, of fast loop modules, starting with the bypass only version. And, and then you have one with goes to return to the uh, from the analyzer and one goes to drain and as well as a purge option. So you could see that in this CAD drawing that you see over here, uh, we come them in multiple different uh, configurations and uh, you can use it for either gas or liquid. And it's standard is typically about half inch or quarter, uh, quarter inch or half inch tube options where we also do have uh, metric equivalents if you require that. Uh, it's also PED and ATAC certified and it incorporates best design practice. Now, um, I'll touch a little bit about why 
uh, best design practice because typically if you see sample systems, uh, the fast loop, it's pretty much a straightforward uh, system, right? Uh, however, uh, from the pictures that I showed you before, uh, it's not always the case. Let me show you why. Now, when we talk about best design practices, uh, if you look like a, a, a panel like this, if you were to try to service, for example, um, the uh, this swirl clean filter over here, right? This, this uh, self-cleaning filter. Uh, if you were to use standard tube fittings, it's not easy to open because you need to undo the nut and you need to pull the tubing a little bit out. And in this system, it's so compact, that's not possible for you to do so easily. So that's why we introduced, uh, we were utilizing our switch lock uh, VCO fittings. We call them zero clearance fittings, um, which you will see something like this. So switch lock tube fittings, you need to undo the nut and you need to pull out the tubing, which means to say that you need some free play over here. Where else switch lock uh, VCO is that all you need to do is undo the nut and then just put it out. If you can picture that. Now the next picture will show you how it's done. So VCO fittings are typically used in, uh, I think in semicon industry as well, but we use them here because it can be used where you just need to undo the nut and then pull out the valve. This is an example of showing a valve, but in switch lock uh, fast loop modules, we utilize this, this style of fittings, okay? The next is that uh, you could see that uh, we have what we call an interlocking handle over here, which actually couples the three-way valves, two three-way valves over here, uh, and is to eliminate the water effect, uh, hammer effect. Now, those who are familiar with uh, you know, fast loop systems in plants or anywhere, you would see that the fast loop modules typically are controlled by the uh, needle valve, right? So if an example like this would be like your house, you know, in your home, where if you do notice that uh, you have water uh, coming from your water tank, and if you use your taps and you slowly open, sometimes when there's vacuum in the lines, you would hear a very loud uh, slamming sound, what we call a water hammer effect. Now, by having this uh, interlocking handles, you, you eliminate that because you eliminate the chance of introducing vacuum or get, uh, air pockets in the system. So you eliminate the water hammer effect. Now, this may not seem like something very important, but you will notice the next picture here that I show you. These are very familiar. You'll see them a lot in, in sampling system where you'll see a lot of broken pressure gauges. Now, if you look at this, this is because of the, the sudden surge of pressure in the lines uh, and the typical things that firstly gets destroyed along the way is the pressure gauge. So you see here, some of the pressure gauges are broken front is broken, the needle is broken. And if you look at the picture on below, you would see that this shows you a bent pointer. And how that can only happen is that when there is a surge of pressure in the system, it hits the stopper and comes back down and bends the pointer. Now, if you guys can, if you guys are looking at it from a bigger screen, you would see the other picture on the pressure gauge and it looks like a normal pressure gauge. But if you actually notice it over here, the needle has actually went one way, one way around. It just, it's just resting here because it's already overpressured. It didn't bend, but it just stops here. So the point I was trying to make here is that all of this uh, can be eliminated by a proper design, these problems that you face, because uh, pressure gauge business is a really good business uh, where you could see the pressure gauge goes into service for a few months and they will just need to change it. And some of the end users consider it as consumables, right? But you could eliminate this problem just by having a good, better design. The next is, of course, the uh, clear indication of bypass flow rates. Now, what we've seen in, in a lot of sampling system, they do need a flow, uh, a, 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 you could say a flow meter, but they could do it as small as possible. Now, the reason why we have such thing that's a little bit more clearer, some huge, uh, something very big, something very clear, is because, um, not many people uh, understand that filters, like self-cleaning filters that we use in our fast loop modules like this, uh, require some minimum flow rate. If the flow rate is too low, the filters will not work. And then what happens is that the customer will get problems like they're having dirt coming through, you know, they clog up very easily because they do not meet the minimum flow rate requirement. So we do have that uh, big, flow meter placed in our fast loop, just to show that. 
Now, uh, the other thing is that, of course, we're talking about the placement of the needle valves. If you notice any, fa any fast loop, because you need to control uh, the flow, we put a needle valve over here. Uh, but not many do know that the needle valve placement is important for sample system. Now, for liquid sampling systems, you typically would have the needle valve after the flow meter. And for gas, you put it typically before that. 